Welcome to Search Ahead. Today, more than an interview, we will have an introduction. We will be talking to Professor Mark Schreim, the new Chair of Global Surgery at RCSI University. He is on his way from Boston, where he was Assistant Professor of Otolaryngology and of Global Health and Social Medicine at the Harvard Medical School. And also in Boston, where he was working as an otolaryngologist at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. Professor Schreim, Welcome, uh, it's a pleasure having you here. How are you? Thank you for having me, I'm doing great. During the last months we have been asking to our colleagues how coronavirus was affecting their work, but uh, I think it's compulsory asking you how coronavirus has been affecting everything because you are on the way of moving here and uh, as we know that you are trapped in the United States until things get a little bit easier. Um, how is the, the pandemic, how is this pandemic affecting your relocation process? Yeah, it is. It has very, very drastically affected the relocation. I was supposed to be in Ireland uh, last week uh, to start the position. And uh, the EU closed the borders to Americans because, uh, unfortunately, our pandemic is not under control. So, uh, yeah, so I started the job remotely from here in the U.S., hoping to get across to Ireland sometime in the next few weeks. Uh, but we'll see, honestly, we'll see what happens. All the best with the process. Before getting into your new role, could you just tell us when and why did you decide to focus your career on global surgery? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a long, it's a little bit of a long story, so I'm going to try to, to shorten it. Uh, you know, I went into otolaryngology um, and over the course of my training, uh, decided that what I really liked to do was the head and neck cancer surgeries. So all the tumors in this part of the body. Uh, and had, had gone into medicine with a desire to work in what we now call global health, what we used to call international health uh, back then, uh, but really hadn't done much with it uh, during my medical school training and residency and, and fellowships. I finished my first fellowship um, uh, training in Canada and took a year off, actually just left medicine altogether for six months and went traveling, uh, and then spent the second six months of that year working as a surgeon in Liberia on a hospital ship with an organization called Mercy Ships. Uh, that experience, I, I really don't like the word life-changing, but I, I use it for this particular experience because I had been training for 15 years in this specialty, but it was on that ship when I first walked into the, the ward where all the head and neck cancer patients were, all the maxillofacial patients were. I walk into that ward and I see you know, 12, 15 patients all with different maxillofacial head and neck tumors at various stages in recovery. And that's really when it hit me that this is what I've been training to do. Um, I didn't know that I'd been training to do it for 15 years, but this is what I'd been training to do. I went back from that trip, uh, went back, did a second fellowship, got a job, uh, my first sort of full-time academic job in Boston, uh, and worked at that for two years. Uh, at the same time, had started doing some graduate school in global health, a uh, master's in global health. Uh, and over the course of those two years, realized that I would, I would keep going back for couple of weeks at a time to work on the hospital ship in West Africa. And I realized over the course of that time that those two weeks that I would spend were much more important to me, much more centering, much more uh, in line with what I wanted to do than the other 50 weeks of the year that I would spend uh, seeing patients here in the U.S. So it wasn't until 2011, uh, a couple of years after I finished my fellowships that I decided that I was done uh, with full-time clinical practice in the U.S. So I quit my practice. My partner at the time that had hired me uh, was not very happy that I quit. He had to find somebody else. Um, but uh, quit my practice, went back to school to get a Ph.D. in health policy and focused all my work on my PhD, during my Ph.D. on the issue of surgery in low-resource low settings. And that really was it. Um, I knew, I guess I knew in 2007, 2008, but I didn't really finally make the jump until 2011. 
Thanks, and it's, it's very interesting that there is a moment where every everything seems to click and come together. Do you reckon that people understand what a global surgery is? So that is a very good question. I don't think it's generally understood what global surgery is. Uh, and that's because surgeons have been working in global health for a long time. I mean, there is evidence from the 17th century, from the 1600s, of surgeons working in what, what we now call global health. Uh, they, at that point, they tended to be, either be missionaries or they tended to be merchants. Uh, and that, that ethos of one of two things, either flying into, moving to a country and living there for the rest of your life as a missionary uh, surgeon, or more recently, an ethos of let's fly in for two weeks, let's do some surgery, and then we'll come back to our regular practices, uh, which is what I did um, for a while. Uh, that's how generally we surgeons have been viewed in, in global health. Um, and not, not without reason that's been criticized, because that is not a very good way of, uh, of helping build up surgical systems. Back in 2015, when The Lancet published what's been called the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery, uh, was probably, was, was one of the few events that really started to shift the conversation in surgery away from, let's just fly in and do some stuff, to let's really start thinking about surgery in resource-constrained settings in a more academic, more rigorous, more fundamental way, in the same way that we've been doing with the rest of global health. You know, the same way that we've been doing with infectious disease, that we've been doing with nutrition, uh, you know, there have been successes there. Why aren't we doing the same thing? So really, the, the field of global surgery as an academic field is only about five years old. So I think there's still a lot of, uh, a lot of you know, 600 years, sorry, 400 years of practice that we have to, to get out of our system. And now you are leading the RCSI Global Surgery Institute. How do you see the role and what do you expect to achieve with it? Yeah, so I've been, I've been leading the Institute of Global Surgery for a grand total of five days um, right now. So um, I am uh, right now very much in a listening mode and I am committed uh, for the first six to eight weeks of my time at RCSI simply to listen to listen to, uh, to people within the Institute of Global Surgery uh, and to listen to people and the rest of our CSI and in the rest of Dublin uh, and Ireland. Um, because what I've known about, I mean, I've known about our CSI's work in global surgery for a decade. Uh, and, and there's been a lot of great work accomplished with collaborations with COSEXA, with the College of Surgeons of East Central and Southern Africa, and also with research uh, work and development of, of referral pattern, referral systems. Um, so I want to learn this now from the inside because I know all of it from an external observer. I want to learn it now from the inside and I really, my hope for the next, uh, you know, three to five years at the Institute is to build on that really strong foundation uh, and start to create synergies uh, both within the Institute and within our CSI and synergies outside as well, because I really think there is potential, there's huge potential here to move this to, uh, to, a, to a different level and for the RCSI and the Institute of Global Surgery to be one of the leaders in this new era of academic global surgery. Uh, before finishing the interview, I would just like to ask you about some personal aspect that is uh, well known for maybe people who know you, but uh, maybe for many the many people who are watching this video uh, is very unknown and is your your other identity, the, the ninja surgeon. Yes, sir. Uh, could you just tell us a little bit about that? There is, a, there is a Japanese TV show that's been around for a long time um, that about 12 years ago uh, was turned into an American TV show called American Ninja Warrior. Uh, and back in 2016, in a fit of 
two o'clock in the morning, let's make bad decisions, uh, I decided to apply for this TV show. Um, and uh, yeah, I you know got accepted to to compete on it. It is a show. It's a show that has not made it to Ireland yet. Um, there is there is stuff happening in the UK, um, but nothing, as far as I can tell, happening in Ireland yet. But basically, it is a it is a big obstacle course that competitors just have to complete all these obstacles without falling off of off of them. Um, and uh, you know, I had I had been I've been a rock climber for over a decade now, and I just thought you know this is, this will translate very well. So I applied, I got accepted, I competed on the show back in in 2016, and uh, did did okay. And then basically an addiction was born, and uh, I've been doing it I've been doing it since. Unfortunately, with COVID, uh, all the gyms are closed, all the all the competitions are closed. Um, so I think for a lot of us right now, this, the the goal is just to not get too weak, um, so that when it starts up again, uh, we can start again. Um, I, uh, in the back of my mind, I am hoping that sometime in the next year we can start a little bit of a ninja movement in Dublin as well. That sounds good. We we'll wait for it, and it's good to know that you are good. Uh avoiding obstacles. So, <laughs> I feel like there'll be plenty, yes. <laughs> well, thank you very much for, for your time. Um, and uh, it's great uh, to have you here. And it will be even better when you can uh, finally arrive to Dublin. And thank you for having me. Thank you very much for having watched this video. Remember that you can access to previous interviews in our YouTube channel and you can keep updated following us in social media. Take care and keep yourselves safe.